Good morning, everyone, and then Good morning. Welcome to Navigating Difficult Conversations in the Classroom Through the Study of Great Books. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge our sponsor, School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership, the Master's Program in Classical Liberal Education and Leadership at Arizona State University, engages the classical texts and great thinkers of history in Socratic seminar discussions with world-class professors. This interdisciplinary master's degree is designed specifically for educators at classical schools. Evening classes, a hybrid of in-person and synchronous online courses, and generous scholarship packages make it ideal for busy K-12 teachers. By enrolling in this program, you will join a community of students and faculty orientated to the holistic pursuit of knowledge. I want to encourage you, if you're way in the back, to move forward. We actually have handouts here at this front table, if you're interested uh, in grabbing some of those. So let's turn to our topic. Classical education engages students in conversations about the subjects and questions fundamental to the pursuit of knowledge for every human being. Through the consideration of the great works of literature, history, and philosophy that form our common understanding of the world, the content of these conversations is often very complex, perplexing, even troubling, and sometimes complicated by the challenge of events in the world beyond the academy. The purpose of this panel is to discuss how to engage classical education students in challenging subjects through the study and discussion of the great books and classical texts. I'm gonna introduce our, our speakers. First, we have here Karen Taliaferro from Arizona State University. She is an assistant professor in the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership with research interests in the history of political thought, religion, and politics, and medieval Islamic philosophy. Her 2019 book, The Possibility of Religious Freedom, Early Natural Law, and the Abrahamic Faiths, examined the perennial conflict of divine law and human law proposing a re-examination of ancient and medieval traditions of natural law to mitigate the conflict. Dr. Talaferio's education includes a Bachelor's of Arts in Political Science and French from Marquette University and a PhD in Government from Georgetown University with additional training in Classics at Northwestern University. And then we have uh, Mr. Ian Rowe. He is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, the founder and CEO of Vertex Partnership Academies, a virtues-based international baccalaureate public charter high school in the Bronx. He's also a senior visiting fellow at the Woodson Center. In addition to serving 10 years as CEO of Public Prep, he held leadership positions at Teach for America, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the White House, and MTV, where he earned two public services Emmys. With his book, Agency, Mr. Rowe introduces an empowering framework, free family, religion, education, and entrepreneurship. And then we've got Mr. Jacob Howland. He is the provost and director of the Intellectual Foundations Program at the University of Austin. He was formerly McFarland Professor of Philosophy at the University of Tulsa, where he taught for 32 years. He is the author of five books on Plato, Kierkegaard, and the Talmud. His articles on literature, politics, and the academy have appeared in The Nation, The New Criterion, Commentary, The Claremont Review of Books, The Jewish Review of Books, City Journal, Mosaic, Unheard, and Quillet, among many others. And then we have Mr. Dr. Dan Scoggin. He is the co-founder of Great Hearts Academies, from 2004 to 2015, he directed the Great Hearts Network's growth and academic model, including Great Hearts expansion into Texas. Great Hearts now serves over 28,000 students at 41 public charter schools in Phoenix, San Antonio, North Texas, and Baton Rouge, with immediate plans to expand into Florida. This fall, Dan has overseen the opening of two Great Hearts Christos Academies in Metro Phoenix, a private classical Christian model of schooling made possible through the Empowerment Scholarships accounts. 
All right, so we're ready to jump in um, directly with remarks from each of our panelists. And then at the very end, there'll be a time for all of you in the audience to ask questions. So I'm going to start first with Karen. I think we're, oh no, do we want that? Okay, are we good on sound? Great, um, I'm a little too short to see the slides <laughs> from seated, so if my co-panelists don't follow suit, that's why. Um, so first, a huge thanks to Great Hearts, to the Great Hearts Institute, to Dr. Carol McNamara particularly, um, to all of you for turning out, to our wonderful Skettle students who are here in the front. It's so good to see you all. So to the chase, because I think time is quite short, um, our, our mission at the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership entails both um, a commitment to Western civilization, the great books, liberal education, classical education, as well as civic education, and to some extent, attempting to do something about the polarization that we find ourselves in. So this mission to navigate difficult conversations in the classroom has been, to some extent, with us from the beginning, but how to do so. So I've got the three models that I want to discuss, hopefully rather briefly. Um, the first of which I was trained in just a bit um, two summers ago. It was at Duke University. There's a fabulously popular course there called How to Think in an Age of Polarization. It was created and taught by this professor here on the left side of the screen, John Rose. Um, he has a, a quote here. The, the object of this course is that students come together in a seminar course. They discuss really controversial, really difficult topics face to face, and apparently, from all reports, with a great deal of success. They'll tackle anything from race issues, gender, sexual assault, um, more nuanced uh, Duke particular issues like their presence in China. Um, they're coming with different ideological, religious, political positions. And by all accounts, it's, it's really a wild success. Um, as we see, Jerry Seinfeld even showed up to observe one of the classes. It's been profiled in I know not how many publications. Um, so a group of us, uh, faculty from across the country, were trained to some extent in, in sort of the tactics and mission of that course. So that's the first model, and I'll get into sort of the comparison in a little bit. The second model then, let's see if I can manage this, there we go, is the Braver Angels Bridge USA one. Um, so shortly after I participated in that seminar, I, I became the faculty fellow at ASU for a national study led by the University of Delaware, I think a sociologist there, on the impact of campus debate programs, um, Braver Angels and Bridge USA. Um, the, the, this is something I'd always been interested in because it actually purports to do something similar to what John Rose's class does, right? To bring people together, to respectfully disagree, to have um, sort of reasoned debates. They describe their own mission as a collaborative search for truth, right? So I had never participated in this, so the first task was to have a trained Braver Angels moderator come and, and chair a debate in my own class. Um, the students chose the punishing topic of transgender athletes, which I was, you know, nervous about, but it, it did go quite well. Um, I then also helped to host, we did this over a, an academic year, um, to host three or four, I think, campus-wide debates, although relatively limited, 25 to 30 participants, on topics from banning TikTok, U.S. intervention and in international human rights violations, um, transgender athletes again, and I forget what the, the other topic was. So... There's much to be said for really for both, for each of these models separately and, and for both together. Um, the Braver Angels, I've got a few of these you know, sort of characteristics of this. It doesn't rely on, it doesn't assume trust, right? People can come without knowing each other. It's very formalized, very structured. Uh, students address Madam or Mr. Chair, not each other. So I'm, I'm quite a fan of procedure, and I like keeping passions restrained in these debates on hot topics. So I think there really is a lot to this. Um, I'll mention that in my own class, students had mixed and yet strongly held opinions about whether the more direct John Rose face-to-face-say-anything approach, which is what we tended to use in our own setting, 
was better than, in, in their views, this more structured approach. But so far, I've not talked about the classics, right? So I think that the topic of this panel, incorporating classics into these difficult conversations on polarizing and difficult topics is really important. And it's, it's important for a few reasons. Um, first of all, the classics just have a lot to tell us, right, about disagreements, about how disagreement is actually hard to achieve, a good disagreement is hard to achieve, um, ways to go about it, right, ways not to go about it. Um, but I think the more important reason, in my view, um, it's a bit more controversial, maybe not so much here, but outside of these walls, is that the classics also help us they add to the, the, um, the difficult conversations not just the element of mutual respect, which is what the Braver Angels and, the, this, again, this Duke seminar under John Rose, those certainly are teaching that. But the classics help us, at least when we do them well, when we read the classics well, they help us in the pursuit also of truth. I don't mean that that's the only function of reading the classics or of a classical or liberal education. I don't mean to reduce it to some kind of analytic philosophy. But it's difficult to see how a student who walks away from a classical education does so without a concern for the, the joint question of what is true and how do I know what is true. And that part can't be left out of the difficult conversations, or at least I maintain that. So I think there's a great advantage in having these difficult conversations in the context of a classical education. Right? Doing so means that we move from an exercise in sharing our opinions, which is hard enough, especially in polarized times like these, to a collaboration in the quest for truth, right? A collaboration that, when it's done with any measure of humility, can itself help navigate those conversations. We put ourselves, perhaps, in the places of Socrates and Thrasymachus. Um, we can debate justice, right? We can work out the differences between knowledge and belief with Aristotle, with Averroes, with Galileo. Um, we can work out what property is, what it should be, who should have it and why with Locke and Marx. Doing so, it hardly gives us the truth about any one of these matters, but it does help us, it helps our students, to see that arguing is meant not just to win, that's not the point, but rather to learn what is true. So, what is the model in my own classroom? Um, whoopsies, I skipped this. Oh, I see I'm now on the screen, that's alarming. Um, there we go. I wanted to highlight this particular toolkit here. This is the Braver Angels curricular toolkit. I cannot, for the life of me, get it in a slide. But it's worth looking up if you are interested in having debates in your classroom. The Braver Angels campus debates, these are sort of off the cuff. There is a way to do those debates as assigned work, which is actually something of what I've, I've incorporated into my own model. So it's on ACTA's website. Um, you can just Google. I think you have to request it. It's the Braver Angels curricular toolkit, really useful. But to my own model, I have very tediously put my syllabus on a PowerPoint. This is um, the, the utmost of banal. Still, I want to talk about how I've attempted to do classics with difficult conversations. And I know time is short, so I'll, I'll skim through it. Um, my own, I mean, the MO is to keep a sort of survey course of moral and political thought, which is what we already have, a, a course that's quite, um, quite popular at ASU. Um, but what I do is I form the students into groups at the beginning of the semester, and then there will usually be some exercises, some discussions and such to help with group cohesion along the semester. Then the final third to one quarter, depending on the size of the course, is dedicated to student group-led debates. So those groups have to choose a topic, they form a resolution, they divvy themselves up into pro and contra, um, depending on what they actually believe. I'm asking them to argue what they actually think. Um, so again, this isn't just an exercise in, well, hypothetically, right? But like, I think this. How can I have a difficult conversation with you? Um, and they also assign informative readings, which are you know, contemporary readings, um, data. It's meant to give them information um, to their peers to read for their class session. But critically, in the debates, so they might choose... Um, you know, we've done gun control, for instance, and I can't think of the particular resolution, but, you know, whatever, bump stocks should be banned in the United States. They have to provide informative readings so that this isn't just an exercise in opinions, 
um, but it's actually informed. But then they also have to refer back to the classical sources we've been reading. So I think that the goal in infusing all of this together is that students aren't just opining because they have to be informed on the actual issue, but nor are they just engaging in contemporary debates. They're thinking through these timeless, these classics and the principles that have been expressed, argued over, refined and honed over centuries, even millennia. Um, in doing both of those things, they'll also come to see that learning the truth and therefore holding a true belief about a given topic is actually very difficult and it's essential, right? That having these arguments, if there is no truth, is pointless. Um, and, and I think that the humility that comes with that exercise both enhances their own ability to learn truth and enhances that other element that I think these other models are doing so well of coming to respect each other. So, as I, I hope is clear, and I don't know if I have much else here, um, I have a few examples of, of you know, some really controversial things that are said in some of these, these classics. If you want to talk about censorship, we've done um, you know, canceling speakers. We've got some wise words from Maimonides. We've got Plato himself. We've got you know, Western civilization, Gandhi on, on Western civilization. There's plenty of controversy already in the classics that we can bring into our contemporary discussions. Um, so the model, my own model, is certainly an evolving one. But what I, I think is becoming clear is that the potential of the classics in general and, and certainly a classical education more broadly for equipping students to do that joint mission of learning to respect each other and also pursue the truth the potential there is tremendous. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning. Yes. Uh, there were handouts, if you hadn't uh, received them. On that table is both a copy of something called uh, the Calvin Report. Uh, which is from 1967 to help uh, institutions of higher education pursue this idea of institutional neutrality, as well as the University of Chicago, uh, uh, their statement of principles around freedom of expression. I'll refer to those a uh, uh, little bit in my remarks. Uh, so it's great to be here. My name is Ian Rowe. I'm the founder and CEO of Vertex Partnership Academies. Uh, let's see. Should I be seeing uh, my slides here? They're currently having an issue with the deck. They're working on it. No. OK. All right. The show must go on. <laughs> um, so I'm the founder and CEO of Vertex Partnership Academies, which is a classically inspired, uh, virtues-based uh, international uh, baccalaureate public charter high school in uh, community, district, community school district uh, 12. Uh, in the Bronx, in the Sound View section of the Bronx. It's one of the um, uh, most intense uh, uh, or highest poverty uh, community school districts in the country, um, predominantly uh, low-income students, uh, black and Hispanic. Uh, of, of all the students that start ninth grade uh, in this particular district, uh, if you start ninth grade four years later, only 7% uh, graduate from high school ready for college. Meaning that you start ninth grade and four years later you've, you've either dropped out or you've actually earned your high school diploma but you still can't do math nor reading without remediation if you were to go um, to college. So this is a, a community in which we thought we need to bring the most exceptional uh, education uh, to this community. So we opened our school in 2020, 20, 2022 uh, and I was going to show you a, a great picture uh, of our students with uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Clarence Thomas, uh, who we've now visited with. We brought uh, our, both our ninth and 10th graders uh, with him three times, uh, June of last year, uh, September, Constitution Day, and then just a, a couple of months ago, uh, again, at the Supreme Court. And uh, the reason I was going to show you that picture is that one of the things that we try to do as it relates to navigating difficult decisions in the classroom 
is to take uh, uh, key issues and here we go, look at this. Oh, almost. Um, uh, is to take uh, key issues, for example, race-based affirmative action and actually try to have audiences with our students and people who are extremely well-versed on those issues. So we had an opportunity uh, on Constitution Day uh, at the Supreme Court with Justice Thomas, about 60 of our students, to actually talk with him uh, about the pros and cons of race-based affirmative action. We'd studied all of the different uh, dimensions, looking at the, the Harvard case, the North Carolina uh, case, so that we could actually have, there it is. Okay, so the picture's there, there we go. Uh, so this is a, a photo of our students with, with uh, Justice Thomas. Uh, it was really a phenomenal uh, opportunity to engage in a real live discussion on a, on a topic that's of great relevance, uh, certainly to our students, of whether or not race-based affirmative action uh, should exist uh, in higher education uh, college admissions. And what was interesting about the discussion after we ended it uh, with Justice Thomas afterwards, uh, I asked uh, our students, uh, would, uh, so now that you've had this discussion, you've had a little bit more time to think about this issue, when it comes to college admissions, do you think you should have an inherent advantage or an inherent disadvantage based on skin color? Should anyone have an inherent advantage or inherent disadvantage? It was a phenomenal conversation where basically no one in the class said that, that they said we should be neutral, we should be competing on equal footing, but the the quality of the conversation, given that they'd been exposed to all of the pros and cons, was very, very rich. Um, and so I think it's a very important uh, concept because we're, li we're living at a time now where kids are getting lots of information, not necessarily representing high quality information or the totality of, of um, perspectives on different issues. In New York City, as you might imagine, over the last few months, we've had many protests uh, at the high school level in many different schools across New York City where kids are marching and, and saying things like, uh, you know, from the river to the sea uh, relative to the, the Israel-Palestinian conflict. And the vast majority of these kids have no idea what river they're talking about nor what sea they're talking about, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So how do we create an environment where our kids have access to high quality information, multiple perspectives on a range of issues so that they can ultimately make decisions for themselves. So uh, Vertex Partnership Academies, our uh, mission statement, as I said, you know, we seek to develop virtuous high school graduates who've acquired the habits, knowledge, and sense of personal agency necessary to lead self-determined, purposeful lives of American and global citizenship. And everything we do, our vision is to cultivate internationally minded, tenacious learners guided by the four cardinal virtues of courage, justice, temperance, and wisdom. And I'll come back to uh, these shortly, but we, we organize our entire school around the cardinal virtues. Um, and cardinal, from the Latin root cardo, uh, which means hinge, you know, all other uh, standards or habits of moral excellence are built off of these four, no, four cardinal virtues. Hence, everything we do, our canon, our curriculum, our schedule even, we're now organizing around these virtues. We also want to be uh, a school that facilitates viewpoint diversity and democratic discourse. And the truth is we've actually had difficulty finding models at the high school level that really do that well, that really do that well. So we started to take a look at what are the exemplars in higher education. And so again, on, on this document, hopefully some of you have it, there's something called the Calvin Report, uh, which was produced in 1967. I think it's um, worthwhile just reading the actual language. Um, because this was an effort to help institutions of higher education 
understand what role they should be playing in the education of their students. And so this is straight from the report, and you have the full report in that document. But the neutrality of the university, neutrality of the, universe, of the university as an institution arises then not from a lack of courage, nor out of indifference and insensitivity. It arises out of respect for free inquiry and the obligation to cherish a diversity of viewpoints. So this report was trying to establish that the institution, if you look at the very last line, the university is the home and sponsor of critics. It is not itself the critic. It's a very powerful statement for an educational, educational institution to say, you know, we're not gonna put our thumb on the scale on any given issue, but we wanna create an environment where people who do wanna put their thumb on the scale have the ability to speak freely. So this is a very powerful document that was actually created in 1967. And as a follow-up, um, I think uh, University of Chicago Statement of Principles, I think was 2014, I'm not sure exactly. But, but similarly, the University of Chicago wanted to create a statement for how do we actually create an environment of viewpoint diversity. And again, there's a copy of this on, on the table. But the university's fundamental commitment is to the principle that debate or deliberation may not be suppressed because the ideas put forth or thought by some or even by most members of the university community to be, of, to, to be offensive, unwise, immoral, or wrongheaded. It is for the individual members of the university community, not for the university as an institution, to make those judgments for themselves. So again, another powerful statement. And in the current context, many universities, if you've seen what's happened at Harvard and all these other places, are now saying, wait a minute, we've actually gone too far in taking positions on uh, uh, political and social issues. So there are more and more universities who are now rediscovering uh, the Calvin Report and uh, the University of Chicago statement. But here's the thing. So now at the high school level, so while we've just seen models of what higher ed institutions are starting to explore in terms of institutional neutrality, the truth <coughs> is at the high school level, at least at our high school, we're not neutral. We, we have a very deliberate uh, intent to uh, inculcate um, and, and I dare I say, indoctrinate, because that's a word that's often used in a negative sense, we have a deliberate intent to indoctrinate our students into the four cardinal virtues. And we've actually gone even further this year because we didn't want it to just be courage, justice, temperance, wisdom, because someone might hear those words and come to their own conclusion as to what it means for them. So we've actually created what we call I statements. So if you come to Vertex and visit us in the Bronx, go to any student, they will say for courage, I reject victimhood and boldly persevere even in times of uncertainty and struggle. Or wisdom, I make sound judgments based on knowledge of objective universal truth. Not truths, truth. You know, even our cell phone policy, which we banned cell phones from all uh, throughout the school day, we grounded that in our cardinal virtue of temperance. I lead my life with self-discipline because I am responsible for my learning and my behavior. So we have now been grappling with this question of how do we be explicit about uh, the virtues that we are seeking to essentially indoctrinate our students into, while simultaneously creating an environment of democratic discourse, of viewpoint diversity, where in fact we're not neutral. And so uh, we are in the midst, and I'd love to, for those interested to join us, we're in the midst of creating something that we call a statement of institutional totality versus neutrality. And the concept is that 
while we're steeped in the virtues and this is how the character formation, moral formation that we're deliberately <laughs> seeking to build within our students, when it does come to political and social issues, whether, whether or not that is uh, spending time with Clarence Thomas or some of the other leaders that we are now putting our uh, kids in front of, how do we create a concept of totality where we're exposing our kids to multiple viewpoints, multiple perspectives on any given issue? So not neutral, but total. And it's, uh, it, it, it requires much more um, research. It requires much more preparation, professional development uh, for our teachers. But this is the way in which, and, and, and just so you know, we're using the classics. We will be using uh, so our, our, uh, our curriculum that we're creating this framework around the cardinal virtues. Uh, imagine for three months the, the focus area of the school is courage and across language and literature, uh, arts, music, uh, uh, poetry, uh, we are linking classics together that reinforce these concepts that then uh, address, we think, uh, opportunities to address political and social issues. So a statement of institutional totality. One of the things that we think is very, very important is that you have to write down what it is uh, that you are espousing. What is it that you believe? And so for us, uh, a statement of institutional totality along with our cardinal virtues is the way in which we're trying to create an environment where we can be explicit about the virtues against which we want our kids to really be grounded, while also creating an environment where our kids can be knowledgeable to the best of our uh, ability, uh, uh, institutional totality on political and social issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here. It's an honor to be on this distinguished panel. I want to talk uh, today about how classic texts and great books can facilitate conversations that in recent years have become very difficult indeed. I believe that classical texts and great books are an excellent way to discuss contemporary issues. Um, and doing so reinforces, or reinforces the importance of the classics as a guide to understanding the world. And if this is done well, the conversations, even on the most contentious issues, need not be troubling. So there are two distinct approaches, I think, to discussing hot button issues. One, I would say, is direct. Let's discuss race in America. Now, this is not very effective, because what it invites the students to do is to immediately segregate themselves, take up entrenched positions, and be ready to fight. I think the indirect approach is much better, and that is by way of the text. So for example, if you wanted to talk about the difference between males and females by nature, or as that difference has been articulated in custom and convention, an excellent way would be to read Homer and let the conversations arise naturally, or to read Plato's Republic, for example. Or if you want to talk about censorship, why not begin by reading dystopian fiction? fiction or Soviet memoirs. This is much preferable to the direct approach. But our prompt for this session has to do with conversations about classical texts that can be difficult. So I want to talk about some of the reasons those discussions could be difficult. One is misconceptions of what the text actually says. And I think that this problem is resolvable by a close reading. So, Here's an example, Aristotle on slavery. Um, I was at a job interview many, many years ago, and I was asked uh, by the chairman of the department, well, how do you teach a text that's racist like Aristotle's politics on slavery? And I didn't have the wit to give him the proper response, which is, you have fundamentally misunderstood what Aristotle is saying. Um, it's commonly understood to be a defense of slavery, and that's exactly wrong. Aristotle writes, he who participates in reason, logos, enough to apprehend, but not to fully possess it, is a slave by nature. What he's talking about is somebody whose intellectual capacity is more or less like that of a child, and that person needs guidance. So I think, for example, of my wife's cousin. Um, 
who was cognitively challenged. But he had a good life. He had a good life because he lived in a group home with five other men who were in similar straits, and there was an individual who coordinated their activities in the home, helped them to cook, and so forth. And he had a meaningful job uh, that gave him dignity. He participated in the Special Olympics. That's Aristotle's natural slave. And the relationship between the master and the slave, as Aristotle puts it, is mutually beneficial, okay? So it obviously helped my wife's cousin to have somebody making executive decisions and assisting him, and it helped the individual who was doing that because he was helping other people. Um, and in fact, um, Aristotle's arguing that that's what a slave is in his terminology. But the fact is that there is no society in the history of the world in which slavery is practiced that selects its slave on the basis of natural slavery. The Greeks and everybody else just enslave people with the sword. They don't say like, by the way, I'm gonna do a cognitive examination of you, you know. Are you a natural slave? In which case I will now enslave you. So it is actually a profound critique of the institution of slavery, the historical institution. The next two difficulties I think are closely related. Not a misconception of the text, but an accurate understanding of what the text says that conflicts with the views that are widely perceived to be held by others, right? So we understand what the text is saying, and you have a perspective on the text, but you don't want to articulate it because you're worried about the consequences of doing so. What will people think of you? If you think, and you may be wrong, that everybody else holds a contrary view. That, I think, is resolvable by inculcating the understanding that the classroom is a place of open inquiry and civil discourse for the sake of better understanding the truth. Now, by the way, that's going to lead to another question that I'm going to pick up in just a second. But you can show that you're serious by adopting, as we are going to adopt at the University of Austin, what are called Chatham House Rules. Chatham House Rules are very simple. No one, you, you can discuss outside of the classroom the views that were exchanged, but you may not attribute them to an individual by name. And of course, that also means you can't take out your smartphone and film them and then go on social media and say, look what Joe Schmo said. That's a way to make sure that you can have honest conversations. And then finally, there's a closely related difficulty, an accurate understanding of the text that challenges a student's deeply held beliefs. So this isn't a question of what other people think or what you think they might think about you if you think it, but your deeply held beliefs are challenged. Well, that's the purpose of education. Plato's cave image, you know, it's a slippery, difficult, hard, upward road uh, to climb in the dark. And in the classroom, this is best done, I think we will all agree in this room, in community with others, in discussion. And that requires the courage to show your inmost self, to be honest about your beliefs. Now, without the great books to guide us, we, as we were informed yesterday um, by Tony Abbott, uh, the former Prime Minister of Australia, we would be informed only by those in our immediate vicinity, and our lives would be, as he put it, Hobbesian, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and I will add, short, probably. Now on these points, as difficult as it may be, the, uh, the aim of civil discourse in the classroom is the discovery of truth. But I think it's really important to have a conversation with students about why they should care about the truth. You know, Aristotle says in the first line of his metaphysics, all human beings desire by nature to know. I happen to believe that is true, although I would add the qualifier, some people only want to know a little. But we also want other things, other things that we may value more than the truth, like social acceptance, like not paying the penalties that are involved in being censored or canceled by your group. And for many people, that's more important than the truth. So how high, you might ask, of yourself and students, does truth-seeking rank in your priorities? Now, in this connection, I would suggest it would be worthwhile to discuss with students a classic text. A passage from a classic text, this is from chapter two of John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. I think it would provide a good focus for discussion. Here's what 
Mill points out in this passage. He points out the cost of conformity, right? The cost of caring more about what other people think. Richard Feynman, the great physicist, wrote a great book called What Do You Care What Other People Think? The cost of caring about other people think on your own self. And he writes, in our times, from the highest class of society down to the lowest, everyone lives as under the eye of a hostile and dreaded censorship. Not only in what concerns others, but in what concerns only themselves, the individual or the family, do not ask themselves, what do I prefer? Or what would suit my character and disposition? Or what would allow the best and highest in me to have fair play and enable it to grow and thrive? They ask themselves, what is suitable to my position? What is usually done by persons of my station in pecuniary circumstances? Or, worse still, what is usually done by persons of a station and circumstances superior to mine? I do not mean that they choose what is customary in preference to what suits their own inclination. It does not occur to them to have any inclination, except for what is customary. Thus the mind itself is bowed to the yoke. Even in what people do for pleasure, conformity is the first thing they think of. They like in crowds. They exercise choice only among things commonly done. Peculiarity of taste, eccentricity of conduct, and are shunned equally with crimes until by dint of not following their own nature, they have no nature to follow. Their human capacities are withered and starved. They become incapable of any strong wishes or narrative pleasures, and they are generally without either opinions or feelings of home growth or properly their own. Now, is this or is this not the desirable condition of human nature? And it's also helpful to talk with students about speech, the medium in which human beings pursue truth, and in particular to try to get clear what speech is. And here I recommend an article by Wilford McClay in The New Criterion, a very recent article. Uh, he distinguishes logos, or speech, from expression. And as the word expression suggests, it's pressing something out, getting things off your chest. A primal scream is expression. It's not logos, it's not speech. And he says of speech that it is a political as well as an intellectual medium. It is, he writes, the human gift par excellence. It is the medium by which we engage in rational deliberation, the way that we work things out together, solve problems, state and apply moral principles or principles of action. Speech occupies, he says, a middle ground between thought and action, a sort of buffer zone in which we can consider together different courses of action prior to acting on them. The whole idea of allowing speech to be free depends upon its being securely situated and mostly confined to this middle transitional zone. And here I would interject, we can think of examples from college campuses today in which speech, speech crosses over into action that intimidates others and corrodes the conditions under which students and faculty can speak freely. And this leads to another point that McClay makes. He writes, there's been much talk of safe spaces in the contemporary academy, but words are our principal safe space especially in the academy, since they are where the most dangerous ideas can be explored safely, as in nuclear containment units, without immediate consequence. So in conclusion, I would say that helping students to understand these ideas creates a foundation for meaningful discussions of even the most contentious issues. Thank you. I just want to go to q &A. Yeah, there's only 10 minutes. We actually have 15. Well, I know we need to save time for questions, and those were just wonderful remarks, so I don't want to, to rush the Q&A. Uh, so, but turn out, I'll follow your lead. You just pull that hook or rope, and I'll, yeah. you know, we'll, go to, right. we'll, we'll go to questions. But I just wanted to say it's great to be here with Ian Rowe. Um, if you haven't read Ian, Ian Rowe's book, Agency, it's one of the best books I've read in the last couple of years. I've known Ian for 20 years. We've been opening schools together. He also opened a network before, before Vertex. And I'll just make a couple po points. I'll try to kind of modify my remarks down a little bit here. But, you know, it's an incredibly polarized age. Uh, this has been said already by other panelists. And, you know, the next nine months are going to be very hard for us K-12 educators with this presidential election going on. What will our faculty offices look like? Um, and how do we instantiate in our schools this place of, of real discourse? 
But at Great Hearts, amid the contemporary winds of, of polarization and politics, I'd argue that it's the character of the teacher that is the best venue to the pursuit of truth. Um, we, we don't want to instantiate just these power discussions. We want to instantiate in our K-12 schools a place where students can seek virtue over time. We are not little free speech colleges or universities in running K-12 schools. Rather, we are training young souls as early as kindergarten to love what they ought and to be repulsed by what they should be repulsed by. This is Plato, right, in the Republic. Of course, our schools are continuums of habit formation, and the intellectual freedom accorded a senior is very different than that accorded a six-year-old or five-year-old in K and first grade. All classical schools push into the reality of truth, but maybe pedagogically, all classrooms may be pedagogically quite different depending on the grade and indeed the subject taught. So when we think of difficult topics, as my colleague suggested, and how to address them in K-12 schools, we should start with ordering our own virtue. We teachers don't work for our own agenda. I work for the great conversation of Western culture. And while I carry my character and curiosity into the classroom, I don't wear my identity on my sleeve as the postmodern world might see it. I have a calling and vocation as a classical teacher. I am not a white Catholic Republican, 55-year-old male from suburban Arizona, although I may resemble that remark. I'm an ambassador of a great tradition that far exceeds me and the students I serve. If our students pigeonhole us as teachers and pigeonhole each other, we are arguing against a false perspective, a 2024 soundbite, instead of entering what Hutchins calls the great conversation of Western culture. We should not engage in these petty power dynamics, but open the discussion, the great dialogue. I'm an ambassador for Moses, Plato, Dante, Austin, Locke, or Douglas, or the other great thinkers that, who have their standing in the great conversation. The students then add their fresh insights or their dialogue to these texts as they are evoked, their, these ideas. But we start from the books first and what they're saying about the human condition not the perspective of me or a 15-year-old in suburban Arizona or San Antonio where Trinette teaches. So Luis Cowan from the University of Dallas, the late Luis Cowan, who's, we are just a wonderful devotees of, of Luis, and she influenced many of us in the formation of classical education. She says, quote, we teachers are the representatives of a culture, and the enemy of education is barbarism. And I would say this barbarism is not thinking deeply, is not the reflective light. That would be a short definition of the barbaric code. The teacher's duty is thus to fight off that ever-present darkness by preserving and transmitting the heritage of freedom and virtue that has come to us from the past, but is always open to new insights and new communities. So we start with the tradition, we respect it, we humble ourselves to it, and then we add to it as we mature into wisdom. As such, to close, the most precious commodity in 2024 for a classical teacher, perhaps as, all, as it has always been, is good judgment. Prudence, Aristotle's Greek word phronesis, practical wisdom, the first of the cardinal virtues that, that was previously mentioned. We teachers must have that first and model it relentlessly with goodwill to inculcate it in our students. This good judgment of the teacher is constantly monitoring the direction of conversations. We're not neutral. We're directive, but open and liberal. Constantly directing the conversations of the classroom. Is this conversation or lesson furthering truth, goodness, or beauty? Or is this just about us, about me, about my pride, of our limited convictions here today on March 22nd, 2024? But don't get me wrong, the classical classroom should not be dogmatic. It is liberal. We don't shut down conversations. We instead propel them towards reality. We want students to read and listen as well as they speak. In, in fact, they must read carefully and listen well in order to speak with wisdom, to form grounded judgment and not just opinion. Aristotle and Plato talk about the difference between judgment and opinion. 
We teachers should always be asking if this conversation, as I said, is directing them towards truth. To close, as my good friend Andrew Zorneman says, and he's here at the conference, he says, the claims of my personal truth in my lived experience are woefully neglectful of the relational support on which we rely on what we know. Nature and history teach us that reality is far greater than what any one person thinks and lives. My claims must give way to our claims. My personal truth, to the truth of personal knowledge, hard earned through a good education, and my lived experience to the outward expanse of human experience. So I think at Great Hearts we talk about this word educare, the Latin root for for education. And what does that word mean? The Latin word educare means to pull out, to draw out, to come out. And so we come out of ourselves and our self-creation as postmodern creatures to the great tradition of Western culture. Thank you. All right, so you're welcome to uh, come to the microphone here and ask either specific questions of any one of the panelists or just propose it to the entire panel. All right, go ahead. Thank you all for coming and being the torchbearers you are in your areas. One of the things I have found that has affected classroom discussion the most in my courses has been a lack of belief that there even is truth. So my question for you is, how do you have a conversation when students deeply hold there is no truth? We can move forward, move towards, and, and how do you help them along that journey? I think everybody's mic is on. Are we all still? Yeah, well, you're all mic'd. Okay. And apparently I'm speaking now. Um, <laughs> so I think that no one really believes there's no truth. Um, they think that they believe there's no truth. And it's usually fairly easy to get there to, you know, like, okay, so you don't think that there's truth, but you're making that as a truth claim, right? That's easily enough at the intellectual level dispensed with. What I think they're usually after, and I agree with them, is that truth is very hard to find and that insisting on it and closing down discussion to alternative views. And here I'll add, even those that come from lived experience that we can't really put into propositional language yet, things that maybe don't win an argument, but maybe there's something there, it's worth listening to. But we have to still keep the rules of logic and you know, of rationality as we discuss it. And honestly, I think a lot of it is, is listening. Um, that these claims of like, there's no truth, so you can't be right, and you can't be right, but I'm still right. It's usually born out of at least some desire to be listened to. Um, so that's, I mean, the way that I've navigated in so much as, as I approach it. I'm not sure if that's helpful. Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree that I, it's not that I think that they think there's no truth, but students believe that their truth, their individual truth, is the truth. And, um, and the reason it's so important, I think, for institutions, K-12 institutions, to, to declare that we're not neutral is that we would actually be irresponsible if we weren't taking a deliberate effort to ensure that our kids have exposure to multiple perspectives that are grounded in fact and evidence. Um, you know, they're living in a world where they're getting unfettered information from uh, social media sites and others that that have no bearing on the truth, but if that's the only source of information that you're receiving, then that becomes the truth. So um, the, the only way to get at it is, is to have a deliberate, uh, by design, effort around what are the topics that you're going to be tackling in your classrooms? What are the sources of both historical and modern day text that in our, in, like in our case, how do we anchor the virtues as the vehicle through which uh, young people are absorbing information and coming to their own conclusion. There's no easy answer in the, you know, uh, Dr. Scoggin talked about this presidential election. There's going to be so much misinformation that all of our kids are hearing, but it's, but it's on us. You know, it's on us as leaders of schools to recognize that we have to be the oasis of truth uh, during the school day to ensure our kids are getting accurate information to make decisions in their own lives. Thank you. Next. Thank 
you everybody for your wonderful talk. Forgive me, I'm going to read this out because I want to make sure I get the wording right. But at Skettle, the student body is actually quite varied in political, theological, and economic ideologies. In spite of this, we pride ourselves on the student body being able to conduct controversial and even heated discussions outside of the classroom. We can self-regulate. I think this is because at Skettle, we all believe that civic discussion, and more importantly, civic discussion done respectfully and well, is a virtue. Can these difficult discussions only be successful if this virtue is presupposed among its participants? If yes, how does one go about imbuing this virtue? Does it have to be through indoctrination? And if no, is it possible to reveal and imbue this virtue through discussion if it isn't presupposed? Um, let me take a stab at that. Um, well, since your question comes from the perspective of higher education, let me just say that one of the problems with higher education today with the invasion of ideology uh, and the politicization of a lot of disciplines um, is that it, it's become at least as far as I can see, rather joyless. Uh, one way to um, imbue the virtue of open discussion is to read great books and think carefully about them and talk about them. And uh, at the University of Austin, we've been, we've been having high school seminars. We're working very hard to you know, build our first class and open our doors in September. And um, we bring in high school students some are from classical schools, and, 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 they're, and they're actually used to this kind of process of sitting around the table and talking about a text. Some are homeschooled, and they also have some, fam some familiarity. The public school students, by and large, have never seen anything like it, and it simply blows their mind. And the delight, you know, reading Plato's cave image or reading the Apology or whatever it may be or talking about Hamlet uh, is just palpable, and they're thrilled to be in the company of other students and to be able to talk freely about issues. And that's one way to kind of develop that sense that, yeah, this is really good. It's fun. Um, and I think that's kind of a good basis um, for developing that virtue. Well, just so you know, Karen, Nalani is a, a Great Hearts graduate and also a Skettle graduate, so we have a double win here. And, uh, but, you know, Aristotle, I, I like what Jacob said, but you know, Aristotle says that you can't have the intellectual virtues without the foundation of the moral virtues. Mm -hmm. So uh, it ain't happening if there's b bad will or, or, or ill will in the classroom. You won't be able to have that, that civil discourse unless there's a basic dignity of respect for the teacher and the other students. So you know, those people need to be pulled and sent to some other type of institution. <laughs> so, yes, so yes, so yes, indoctrination has to happen. <laughs> No, as I was uh, saying, since you brought up Aristotle and moral virtue happens through habit, you were saying indoctrination. Do you think it has to start in the home with the parent telling well, the child, you know, we live in America, we're grounded in civic discussion, and this, this is what you do as an individual and citizen here? Uh, I mean, it certainly has to start in the home. Um, and whether we like it or not, uh, schools are becoming increasing the, increasingly a place where moral formation um, uh, has, to, has to occur. I never like to think that we're taking the place of parents and we try to do as much as we can to communicate to parents what we're communicating to their children in hopes of having that be reinforced. Uh, but I think schools have to uh, assume this responsibility uh, now uh, because the institutions through which young people develop these habits, whether through family, religious institutions, community-based organizations, those institutions have, are faltering. Uh, and so I believe our schools have to uh, take the mantle, hopefully as an inspiration, to bring these other 
institutions along. If I could add, because I would lose my license as a Scuttle professor if I didn't name drop Tocqueville, but <laughs> it, it's, it's not coincidental here. I think that Scuttle students are socially very close. I'm sorry now, I'm just bragging about our wonderful department here at ASU, but it is wonderful. And we have, we have a special space for them, a nice library with nice furniture, nice, with cozy furniture. Um, they spend a lot of time outside of the class together. They are having, to bring back to Tocqueville, face-to-face -face conversations that are not mediated through phones, through devices, through social media, and not only happening in formal spaces, but, but elsewhere. And losing that element of education, which is usually, it seems like it's thought of as a luxury or something. It's, it's a mistake. Fostering face-to-face -face relationships and conversations seems to be essential for the other formal kind of learning as well. We've come to the, the end of our time. If you can make your question really quick. Yeah. I'll make, I'll make it brief. Uh, so my question is related to the idea of uh, institutional neutrality that was put forth. Um, so as Mr. Rowe suggested, at his own academy, there's some limits to institutional neutrality in that there are core tenets that the um, institution cannot be neutral on and that students are required to um, uh, take value in or believe in. So my question is, does the rest of the panel agree that in higher ed or whether it be in like a classical education, there are certain principles that the institution cannot be neutral on and if so, how do you um, still encourage students to be like Socrates, to uh, challenge convention and potentially say upsetting things? Um, I can respond to that very briefly. Um, an institution that's dedicated to the pursuit of truth uh, has got to be dedicated to the means of the pursuit of truth, and that means open inquiry and civil discourse. You can't be neutral on those things. And so if people ask, you know, um, are certain kinds of speech that spills over into intimidation action that suggests that some group of students can't speak freely, um, you can't be neutral on that. Uh, and, but however, I do think institutions should be neutral on small p politics. Uh, it, you know, our university is not going to be one in which um, some Supreme Court justice is nominated or some president is elected and we send out text to the students saying, we're offering you counseling, you know, because you must be very upset. Like, that's ridiculous. Yeah, I would just, just briefly add, because I think we're getting close to time, as Trinette said, but, you know, what, sometimes we hire humane letters teachers at, uh, at Great Hearts, and they, maybe they come from St. John's, which is a great institute, and they come in, they think it's just going to be a, they're going to lead a ninth grade seminar, and it's going to be just free Socratic open space, and they don't only have to intervene at all. So... Mm -hmm. The, the mission of a K-12 school is very different than that of a university. A university is educating adults. A K-12 school, particularly ones that have a lower school attached, are forming habits, moral virtues, and then instantiating wisdom and intellectual virtue on top of that, that foundation, classical, essential thought. And so, there, you know, teachers have to correct gross error, redirect. There are times in junior and senior seminars where it does feel open because the, the habituation of the students is so well formed, but there's a lot of work, a lot of training, a lot of moral grounding that's underpinning all of that that begins in kindergarten. Thank you. We've come to the end of our time. Uh, thank you to our panelists. If we could give them a round of applause, please. I would just a little housekeeping note. Uh, we want to uh, make sure that if you have not yet gotten an alert through Hoover to do the survey on the symposium that make sure that you do that before you leave so that the symposium organizers can do an even, even better job next year. So thank you again to our panelists. Thank you.